Hello everyone, welcome back to the first video of 2021 here on this channel. I think most of us can agree that we're very happy to see the back of 2020. However, I wanted to make a video to mark the end of last year to show that it hasn't been a complete show by sharing some actual positive conservation news stories to come out of 2020. After researching this, I realised that there are quite a lot and I'm definitely not going to be able to cover everything in this video. So if I've missed out something you wanted me to talk about, then please don't come from me. I'm sorry. In fact, I spent so long nerding out about all the cool stuff that I found while researching this video that this video is actually coming out two weeks later than planned and I've decided to split it into two parts. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been out for like another month. So today I'm going to be covering a variety of conservation news including some impactful studies, new discoveries, wildlife returns and recoveries and as I have another video that I'm hoping to get up next week, if I actually get the editing done, um, the second part of this should be up in about three weeks talking about the ways people took action in 2020. I won't be going into each story in too much detail as there's a lot to cover but I'll leave the links to everything that I've researched in the description down below. Even so, buckle up because we're in for a long video. Now, despite the dreaded C word, which I'm not gonna say during the course of this video because the YouTube gods will come for me, um, but studies have continued on a small and large scale. And I'm gonna start with possibly the most globally impactful study that has come out this year, at least in my opinion. Now, in July, an independent study was published stating that protecting nature creates far more benefits than costs, both to the economy and to, through other means like ecosystem services. Led by the University of Cambridge and based on the work of over 100 experts, this study was the first of its kind as it assessed the overall costs and benefits of protecting 30% of the Earth's land and ocean by 2030 across many different sectors. This comes after the UN has included its 30 by 30 goal in their draft 10 year strategy and the World Economic Forum has also stated that biodiversity loss is in their top five risks to the global economy. At the UN Summit on Biodiversity, 81 leaders and the Environmental Council of the EU signed the Leaders Pledge for Nature, which links to this 30 by 30 goal. Pledges like this one often fall short of their targets and there are certainly many issues to consider. However, if governments and corporations have clear economic and financial evidence that protecting nature is vital, we are much more likely to get the protections we so desperately need put in place. On a smaller scale, a study has found that the alarm calls of a bird can alert rhinos in sub-Saharan Africa to humans. The red-billed oxpecker, which feeds on parasites on the black rhino, among other animals, could be key to defending this critically endangered species against poachers. Rhinos with red-billed oxpeckers were found to be more likely to detect humans and from further away compared to those without. Of course, this is something that the indigenous people have known for a very long time, hence the fact the Swahili name for the bird translates to rhino guard. So this is just scientifically proven traditional knowledge. However, it can inform conservation by introducing the birds back into the areas where both oxpecker and rhino populations have declined and addressing the issues with pesticides being applied to livestock to kill parasites, which also unintentionally kills the birds eating those parasites. There have also been many discoveries published this year. Some of these were from before 2020. However, the findings themselves were published to the world this year, as these things can take a long time to be confirmed so I'm still including all of them in this list. The discoveries of an expedition to a remote valley in Bolivia have recently been published and they found a treasure trove of wildlife. 1,200 species were recorded in total in the two-week expedition, with 770 being new to this particular valley. They discovered 20 new species along with rediscovering four species. These include two new snake species, three new butterfly species, eight plant species new to Bolivia, and 13 plant species new to science, including a bamboo species which was already well known to the indigenous communities. They actually make new musical instruments out of it, but it had never been scientifically described. To top it off, they also rediscovered species including the devil-eyed frog which hadn't been spotted for 20 years, and a butterfly only found in this particular valley which hadn't been seen for 100 years an understory plant which hadn't been seen for 125 years, and a small tree which had only been documented once, 127 years ago. Many expeditions have been made over the years to find it again, and all had failed until this one. Moving on to mammals specifically, a new species of mouse lemur in Madagascar has been described. It's been called Jonah's mouse lemur after a respected Malagasy primatologist, and was actually first captured in 2006, 
However, as it looked very similar to its relatives, it took many analyses of samples, improvements in genetic technology, and the investigating of small differences in its body structure until it was confirmed as a separate species this year. And that's not the only new primate species that has been discovered this year. A new Langer species has recently been described in Myanmar. After genetic analysis over the course of a few years, it was found to be its own species and was named the Papa Langer after an extinct volcano nearby. However, it's already critically endangered with only around 200 to 260 left in the wild, so conservationists are already working hard to protect it. A species of wild dog closely related to the dingo was recently confirmed to still have a wild population after being presumed extinct in the wild. Only two to 300 New Guinea singing dogs, named after their distinctive call, were thought to be left in captivity and had not been seen by scientists in their native Papua New Guinea since the 1970s. However, reports and photographs emerged of similar looking dogs near a gold mine and after an expedition in 2016, lots of photos and genetic testing, they were found to be a wild population which is more genetically diverse than the severely inbred New Guinea singing dogs left in captivity. This is fantastic news and crucial for the survival of the species. A critically endangered Australian species called the Smoky Mouse was feared to have gone extinct in the wild after 90% of their habitat was burned during the Australian bushfires. But to the relief of conservationists, it was discovered at seven burnt out sites in Kosciuszko. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that Kosciuszko National Park in New South Wales. The government already had a captive breeding program in place, so it's hoped that they can soon start boosting wild populations. An expedition in northwestern Madagascar to find a chameleon species which hadn't been seen in over a century was successful, but it didn't appear where they expected. Researchers discovered three males and 15 females of the Voelts Coast chameleon in a tree, but this tree wasn't in a forest, it was actually in the garden of a hotel. They also found that when the females were experiencing excitement or stress, they could change into a beautiful vivid pattern of black, white and blue. This was seen when they came in contact with a male chameleon and when they were being handled by humans. Moving on to marine species now, a pinnacle of coral larger than the Empire State Building has been discovered in the Great Barrier Reef. This is the first large component of the Great Barrier Reef that has been discovered in over 120 years. It's around a mile wide and stretches one third of a mile above the seabed. Pinnacles of coral like this are ancient and take millions of years to grow to the height that they're at now. Even better news, this reef is healthy and is a beacon of hope for the reef which is experiencing serious bleaching in other areas. That's not the only positive coral related news from this year. Three new species of coral have been discovered more than 670 metres deep in the North Pacific. Scientists used remotely operated vehicles to collect samples from the ocean floor since the areas where black corals live is well below the depths to which people can scuba dive. The corals found had microscopic differences in their skeletons which allowed them to be identified as new species. Black corals are so cool because the compounds they contain have the potential to help us fight all sorts of diseases including cancer. They're also incredibly long-lived because they grow very slowly and their habitats are generally stable over time. Their age can be measured because coral actually develop growth rings like trees. Nobody knows exactly how long they can live for, but one black coral species found near Hawaii can live for over 4,250 years. Studies like this are very important because understanding the importance of deep sea ecosystems can help protect them from destruction caused by deep sea mining, especially in this area of the Pacific where there is a high concentration of valuable minerals. Scientists are waiting for confirmation of a new beaked whale species that was seen in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Mexico. Seeing beaked whales come so close to this research ship was amazing in itself since these elusive animals often avoid ships and the researchers originally thought that they were looking at the endangered species, the Perrin's beaked whale, which has never actually been officially seen alive. However, after taking photos, videos and audio recordings, they found that they had physical differences to the Perrin's beaked whale, such as their teeth position, colouring and size, and the clicks made by these whales didn't match that of the Perrin's beaked whale. None of these characteristics match any other described species of whale either. So they began to realise that they might have found a completely new species. In order to find out, they took samples of the water where they saw the whales dive in the hope that they could extract environmental DNA or eDNA. This is DNA evidence left in the environment by an organism through things like skin cells and faeces. 
Of course, there is always a chance that it is in fact a species which has already been described, but even if it is the parent's beaked whale, a sighting like this is such a rare and special event and contributes to the data we have on these elusive animals. Moving from marine to freshwater, six fish species which were not known to exist in the Amazon were discovered in one of its least studied regions, Calo Norte, which is located between Guyana and Suriname. Calo Norte is an area larger than the UK and makes up part of the Guyana Shield region, where 40% of species are endemic, meaning that they're found nowhere else on Earth. Over 80% of Calo Norte is protected, either as conservation units, indigenous territories, or traditional Afro-Brazilian land, making it the world's largest block of protected forest. However, despite this, it's still under threat from illegal hunting, mining, and logging, so research here is particularly vital. The study in question has been going on for the last 12 years and started with two expeditions in 2008 and 2009, which studied 13,853 animals. As you can imagine, it takes a long time to go through that many samples and researchers are yet to identify around 20% of the specimens that they found. While the six new fish species discovered were not new to science, they had only ever been found outside the Amazon basin, and finding out that their range extends further than previously thought, especially into protective areas, is a very positive thing. Moving on to wildlife returns, be that physical returns to places or rediscoveries. The first of these is a very small animal, the European flat oyster. This native oyster had not been seen in Belfast Lock, a sea inlet in Belfast, Northern Ireland, since the 1800s because it had been so overfished. However, without any sort of reintroduction scheme, this species actually returned on its own, with 41 live individuals being found, and scientists aren't entirely sure how they did it. But it's a very positive thing for the species, which is on the list of threatened and or declining species by the OSPAR Convention, an EU convention to protect the northeast Atlantic's from marine environment. It's also a general positive thing for the loch, because not only do the oysters themselves provide a habitat for other wildlife like algae, worms and anemones, but they also filter seawater, which should improve the water quality. Okay, the next one is very exciting. For the first time in 3,000 years, I'll repeat, 3,000 years, Tasmanian devils have returned to mainland Australia. Tasmanian devils are scavengers and it's thought that they originally died out because all of the animals they eat were hunted into oblivion by humans. So they then had nothing left to eat and their only remaining population for the last 3,000 years has been in Tasmania, an island off the southeast coast of Australia. And to top it all off, the population was drastically reduced by a contagious mouth cancer down to 25,000 individuals in the 1990s. So safe to say they weren't having a very good time. Conservationists have been working incredibly hard to boost species populations and to reintroduce them to mainland Australia. The non-governmental organisations called Aussie Ark, Wild Ark and Global Wildlife Conservation worked together for more than 10 years to create a large fenced off area totaling 1,000 acres called Barrington Wildlife Sanctuary and released 15 captive bred Tasmanian devils in March 2020, followed by another 11 in September 2020. The reason they're in a fenced off area is to make it as easy for them as possible to survive and breed. And before reintroducing the devils, they cleared the area of invasive plants along with cats and feral foxes, both of which are non-native predators to Australia's small mammals. There are plans to reintroduce another 40 Tasmanian devils in the next two years, along with a variety of other native animals. There's also been some good news for pangolins, the world's most widely trafficked animal. They have finally made a return to, and I'm gonna butcher the name of this, the KwaZulu-Natal province of South Africa after going locally extinct in the area between 30 and 40 years ago. The African Pangolin Working Group created a new program to release Temix pangolins, which had been saved from wildlife trafficking back into the wild. Since they often take a lot of rehabilitation, this was what was known as a soft release program. Rather than simply letting them go off into the wild, they were placed in a shelter in a private game reserve and taken for long walks so that they could forage and get used to the area. Depending on how quickly they become accustomed to their surroundings, it could take several days to several weeks before the caretakers felt like the pangolins were ready to be fully released. When they were set free, they were satellite and radio tracked so that the group could see how they were doing and to give them regular medical checkups. Of the seven pangolins released in 2019, two died of natural causes, but the other five are thriving. 
One in particular is special because he was originally found on the side of a road as a baby and is the first Temex pangolin to be hand raised and released back into the wild. So it really is a success story that he and the other four have survived for the past year. Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of the Congo experienced a massive influx of 580 savannah elephants in 2020. This herd crossed the boundary into Virunga from Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. This is a huge step up from the 120 elephants already in the park, boosting the overall population to around 700 individuals, and their presence is already making a difference. Elephants are what is known as a keystone species, as the changes they make to the environment around them allows other species to survive and thrive that wouldn't otherwise be able to. This presence has already allowed for the return of animals like buffalo, lions and warthogs, which had not been seen in the park for around 20 years. It's a beacon of hope for Virunga, which has been experiencing a great deal of hardship over the last few years, especially in 2020. Although this video is about positive news, I really do encourage you to read into the horrific things which have been happening at Virunga, even over the last couple of weeks, as it's something we should all be aware of, and if you can, please consider donating to help them get through this difficult time. Moving on to a very different type of elephant, but still in Africa, the Somali Sengi, a species of elephant shrew most closely related to the elephant, the aardvark and the manatee, has been rediscovered in the African country of Djibouti. The Somali Sengi has been lost to science for 52 years, but research has found a thriving population in Djibouti and pushing for their conservation status to be changed from data deficient to least concern. I have more information about the ICN classifications of endangered species in my All About Sea Turtles video, which I'll link below, but essentially this is a really good thing because it means that there's enough evidence to suggest that these animals have stable populations and aren't threatened. Moving continents now, 100 bison have been released into the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota by, I really hope I get this right, the Sikangu Lakota Oyate? Um, in collaboration with Redco, the US Department of the Interior and WWF. This was seen as a sign of hope and peace for many and has been described as bringing them home. And the phrase really hits the nail on the head perfectly. It's slowly bringing the US back to the days when around 30 million bison called the Great Plains home. Like elephants, they are a keystone species and when they were essentially erased by the end of the 19th century, with the only bison remaining being in zoos and private collections, this completely changed the lives of the Native American nations which had a sacred relationship with these animals and the entire landscape of the Great Plains. A 28,000 acre or 11,300 hectare pasture has been leased for the Wallacota Buffalo Range project for at least the next 15 years and the hope is to boost the herd's populations to 1,500 individuals in the next five years. This would make it the largest herd owned by a native nation. 15 Galapagos giant tortoises, which saved their species from extinction, were released back into the wild in June 2020. After taking part in a 55-year breeding program resulting in 1,900 tortoises being released back into the wild onto the island of Española in the Galapagos, the 12 females and 3 males finally made it home. One tortoise in particular, named Diego, contributed to a whopping 40% of the tortoises now on Española since being removed from the island 80 years ago. After natural breeding between the tortoises which were released, there are now around 2,300 tortoises roaming free thanks to this breeding programme, and the 15 tortoises which made it happen can finally live out the rest of their days surrounded by their descendants. Their return marks the end of one of the most successful captive breeding programs in the world. And for the final part of this video, we're going to be talking about animal and ecosystem recovery. Starting with Canada's most endangered mammal, the Vancouver Island Marmot, a member of the squirrel family, which has experienced a drastic species recovery since 2003 when there were only 30 left in the wild. Thanks to habitat restoration, a captive breeding and release program through Toronto and Calgary zoos, and a monitoring program, the Vancouver Island Marmot Recovery Foundation has increased the wild population to 200 individuals by 2019. And in the last two years alone, there have been over 100 pups born in the wild. Although there is still a great deal of work which needs to be done, this is a promising start and it's hoped that the story of an adorable species like this can help to get people hooked on caring about the conservation of an at-risk species. Back to more positive elephant news now, Ambosley National Park in Kenya has been experiencing a baby boom amongst its elephants. The national park contains around 1,500 elephants, which have given birth to over 200 calves in 2020. This record number actually has something to do with the weather. 
Heavy rains have been found to increase elephant fertility, and since the area has experienced some more extreme weather, heavy rainy seasons followed by bad droughts, this baby boom did not come as much of a surprise, but it's lovely news nonetheless. It follows a positive population growth trend in Kenya across the last 30 years, as conservation work has allowed elephant populations to double. A critically endangered species, the black stilt or kaki in the local Maori language, I hope that's how I pronounced it, I dread to think how many words I've butchered in this, in this video, but this bird has had a massive boost. In August 2020, 104 captive bred animals were released into the wild in its native New Zealand. The black stilt's population had been decimated by invasive predators like stoats, ferrets, rats and cats, as well as to flooding events in their habitat. This long-term breeding program, which was established 40 years ago by the New Zealand Department of Conservation, has really impacted this species, which only had 23 adults and four breeding pairs left in the wild, living on a small part of the South Island by 1981. However, due to their incredible efforts, the wild population increased by 30% just between 2019 and 2020, and there are now 169 adults in the wild. This program is so important because these birds have not evolved a defense against mammalian predators because they should not exist on the island. There are no native mammals in New Zealand apart from bats and marine mammals. All others are introduced. Therefore, when these threats are present, the young have basically no chance of survival until adulthood. Whereas if the eggs are incubated and the chicks reared in captivity, there is a 70% survival chance. These efforts combined with predator control in their habitat should give any young hatched in the wild a greater chance of survival to adulthood. This is one of my favorite news stories. As many people know by now, I love turtles. And there's cautious optimism among experts that populations of several sea turtle species across the world are slowly recovering. This is due to more instances of sea turtles nesting. They've been building more nests, which may hopefully result in more eggs and more hatchlings. Since many hatchlings don't make it to adulthood and breeding age, the more hatchlings that are produced, the more likely it is that the adult populations can be boosted, providing conservation measures are also put in place to protect adult turtles. This has especially been seen in the endangered green turtle, but also in loggerheads Kemp's Ridley, Olive Ridley and Leatherback to a lesser extent. Although there may have been a short-term boost in nesting events in 2020 due to lockdown, preventing many people going to the beach, and so providing less disturbance for the sea turtles when nesting, this overall increase is thought to be much more long-term. This long-term change has been witnessed by turtle conservation projects across the globe, from Thailand to the USA, from India to the Philippines, and started before the lockdowns were even brought in. The real potential reasoning behind this increase in nesting behaviour is much more complex and has to do with the conservation programmes, lawmaking on both the local and international level, and fisheries management. For example, many countries brought in laws preventing the killing of sea turtles, and international conventions like CITES have prevented the trade in their eggs. It could also be due to food availability at sea, since nesting is very much linked to the amount of nutrition the females can get to allow her to produce eggs. Since all of these influences are intrinsically linked and sea turtles take so long to mature, with some species not reaching breeding age for around 30 years, it's important that this vital work never relents, otherwise the positive news we have been seeing can quickly turn on its head. Our penultimate story is one that is quite short but I'm actually considering doing an entire video on the history behind it because it was a topic that fascinated me at uni and I did it as a case study. The Wolves of Yellowstone. 25 years after being reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park, there are now between 300 and 350 wolves present, and instead of wiping out the elk populations as critics feared, it has been found that they have been helping to stabilise the elk populations by taking out the weak and sick animals, rather than having the elk populations yo-yoing, which led to many of them starving to death when the conditions got tough. This is predicted to help the elk withstand the future impacts of climate change, including droughts which are already becoming more frequent in the area. And our final story of today also heralds from the USA and is another positive example of what happens when nature is allowed to just be. A positive to come out of the horrible California wildfires of 2020 was the realisation that one of the best firefighters in that situation was actually the beaver. A new study has found that areas down by beavers can provide refuges for wildlife from fires and can even prevent wildfires from spreading any further. My favourite quote from this article is, 
it's really not complicated. Water doesn't burn. <laughs> and it's true, it shouldn't come as a surprise that when wetlands are created, they can, they can stop wildfires. And being as are ecosystem engineers, which do just that, in fact, the plants found in areas downed by beavers were so saturated by water that they just didn't catch fire, even when a wildfire was raging right next to it. What was left were these green oases next to a completely charred landscape. Now, this is leading scientists to push for beavers to stop being persecuted for flooding roads and damaging human property, and in fact be embraced for their ability to help humans resist and recover from an issue which will only become more and more devastating with climate change. And with that, we have come to the end of part one of our Positive 2020 Conservation Roundup. If you're still here, well done. <laughs> I don't know how long I've been filming for and I don't know how long this is going to be edited down to, but I'm impressed if you're still here, so thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you would like to see more and stay tuned for part two of this, which is all about positive human actions throughout 2020 related to conservation. And I'm going to hopefully be uploading my Christmas in Malta vlog next week as well, if that's something you're interested in. But for now, I will see you in the next one. Bye bye. Well <laughs> God, I'm too enthusiastic and I can't speak <laughs> to go. Can you not, please? You interrupted my perfectly good take. With 770 being... Seriously? May, come on. It's nine o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, after a respected Magalassi Magalassi? Magalassi. Magalassi. No, Malagassi. 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 An, ex an expedition? <laughs> I'm going Aussie. Of the vaults, coals, vault? Oh god. What is that word? For Vaults, coals? Vaults, coals? It's been a while since I've written this. Vaults, vaults. Of the Vowelts Co's <laughs> chameleon. Moving on to marine species now, a pinnacle of coral larth a pinnacle of coral lar I can't say that pinnacle of coral larger. Pinnacle of coral Pinnacle of coral needs to be a tongue twister. Scientists are waiting for confirmation of a new beaked wheel beaked wheel <laughs> in the hope that they could instruct instruct in the hope that they could extract environment extract 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 is a word you can say that word in the hope that they could extract Inst it's not instruct it's extract my goodness in the hope that they can instruct it it's not instruct but even if it is the parents beak that's another tongue twister parents beaked whale around 20 percent of the special 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 Specimens. Six fish species which were known. Six fish species which were. I can't. Six. Why are there so many tongue twisters? Six fish species. I'm definitely going to have to put a section at the end of this, aren't I?